Mike Edwards, OBA, welcome to plzsoccer.com. I'm delighted to have you in the studio because we're going to talk about a topic which I know is at the forefront of your mind. You are certainly uh, one of the most vocal in a campaign to try and remove heading the ball at every level of football. Um, first of all, give us an insight into how you're progressing with it. Peter, thank you for having me on. I'm a, a big fan of, of what you do and it's a privilege to be here. And I'd also like to start by saying thank you to Amanda Coppell. Frankie Coppell's 75th birthday would have been today and we've used the, the event, if you like, to re-release uh, our message to the media and I'm happy to say it's been picked up across, not just Scotland, but across the UK as well. Now, you have been a respected journalist, someone I've worked alongside uh, over the last 25 years. You'll be able to sift through the people who are nice to you and the people who are, uh, shall we say, uh, just going through the protocol. Um, so I'm going to try and play devil's advocate here, Mike. Um, removing heading uh, of the ball from the kids' uh, football, I thought to myself when you started the campaign, great. What's it been like trying to actually implement it in schools? Have you had any kickback from it? The, 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 my main target audience is parents and coaches and obviously the, the game's governing bodies, FIFA and the IFAB. The feedback I have had from parents uh, has been very positive. Many have said, there's no way my children will be heading the ball. If I'm being honest, I've not had a particularly positive um, response from FIFA or the IFAB uh, in, to, to the point that they didn't even reply to my email. Now, the IFAB, the International Football Association Board, is the, the organisation which changes and makes the rules. Um, neither replied to my email. The um, IFAB will only listen to you if you have a suggestion for a rule change, if you are supported by your home football association, in my case, the Scottish FA. Now, I've had meetings with Ian Maxwell. I've had meetings at Hamden with officials there. They, I have to say they were very positive and very supportive, but short of backing my campaign because they felt, and you can ask the SFA yourself, they felt it was too soon, more medical evidence needed to be garnered before they could make that very big call. And that's absolutely fine. But an individual, you and I, can't just tip up to Switzerland and say, look, we need to change the rules, sadly. And FIFA won't uh, even enter the dialogue with me because they've not even responded to my communications. UEFA, however, and I have to thank them very much, um, I used to live in Switzerland, I'm sure I bored you with that story, yeah. and I was there, on, I go there every year on holiday, and I contacted them to say, look, I'm coming out, can I come and see you? And they said no. Uh, but they did agree to an online meeting and I was online with their medical director uh, for a couple of hours. Now, it was just after the Women's World Cup last year, so they were all a bit, you know, a bit tied up, having holidays, etc. But I eventually sat down online with, with, with their team um, and I was very grateful for them for giving me that time because FIFA didn't um, and UEFA asked me to agree not to divulge the contents of the meeting. What I will say, uh, and you are obviously welcome to speak to UEFA yourself and get their response, I think it's fair to say they don't agree with me. But they listened to me and they gave me their counter arguments. Now, I'm not going to go into the, 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 the minutiae of that because I've agreed not to. It's safe to say that they do not agree with me, but they gave me their time and for that I'm, I'm grateful. But the, that, that, that message will continue to be uh, spread by me and it will be you know applied across various levels and ages of the game now I'm not going away yeah. and today we've seen Amanda Coppell incredibly brave uh, who lost her husband t 10 years ago to dementia which she and her family blames on Frank's uh, heading the ball throughout a 30 40 year career yeah. Now, uh, with that in mind, I mean, you mentioned Frank Capel. I can remember from my days watching football, not only Frank Capel, but uh, of the many people that are associated with this fight that you have, um, you know, we'll look at Jimmy Johnson, Chris Sutton's dad, Jeff Astle. I can remember his uh, family uh, taking this fight uh, to the authorities. Uh, in fact, Nobby Styles as well. Uh, so the difficulty um, is in your objective to try and get this implemented by 2030. How do you overcome the obstacles that UEFA have highlighted to you? 
by simply repeating and uh, reinforcing the key message the, 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 there is medical evidence out there, and there will be more medical evidence out there, that heading the ball is, is dangerous and it will ultimately or can ultimately kill you. My, my, the, the two prongs to my campaign here are heading the ball is very dangerous in training. And we've heard, I'm sure Billy McNeil, I remember him saying, he headed the ball hundreds of times a day in training distance headers, power headers to get out of the penalty box. With a really heavy leather with ball. A, with with a, 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 a heavy ball. So for me, the danger is, first of all, in training. You, If you're a professional footballer, you'll train every day and you'll head the ball any number of times per day. That's not good. Secondly, in the game, even Alec McLeish might have played a game in which he didn't, play, didn't head the ball at all. Unlikely. But he, a professional player in a game may not head the ball at all during the game. Yeah. But what he will or she will do is rise, aerial challenge with three or four other players, and if one of them heads the ball, then the other two are going to head each other's heads or they're going to get an elbow in the head. So that's the second danger for me. First danger is the repeated trauma to the head in training. The second danger is occasional trauma to the head by clashes of heads in a game, even if they don't head the ball. Now, that wouldn't happen if heading the ball was removed from the rules. Do you not feel, though, that um, when you're taking this fight to the various organisations that you, you've almost got, you know, one, if not two hands tied behind your back on the basis that other sports have a, a, a similar problem, boxing, well, same situation, yeah, American football, oh, rugby, yeah. I'm thinking of, uh, you know, MMA, yeah. uh, Right, racing, you know, you could get on a horse and fall, you can get you can get a concussion as well. Absolutely. Um, so I, I wonder if, by your actions, even get, getting any kind of result would have repercussions across many sports. I think you're absolutely right. I don't know enough about rugby or, or horse racing or MMA, uh, uh, to, or uh, you know, to talk about the the, the detail. Boxing, I if, <laughs> I would ban that altogether because yeah. I think it's just it's ridiculous in this day and age. Uh, rugby has changed and is going to have to change yet further with the with the concussion rules. With with um, you know, if you are taken off, then you are replaced by a player of the same uh, position, and you have to go through the the, the protocols about concussions and uh, you know if you go back on, if at all. And rugby has come along quite quite a way. Skull caps, uh, you know, that's great. Um, MMA, boxing. Absolutely ridiculous that the whole point of boxing is to is to impose some degree of brain damage on your opponent to put him down. Now you may not go into the ring with the desire to kill him or her or put him or her into forgive me a, a coma, but it's your job as a boxer to put your opponent down with a with a punch to the head and, and a knockout. Uh, that cannot be right in the twenty first century. I'm sorry, that is just. Uh, I find that abhorrent. I can't watch it. Yeah. The other aspect of this, though, Mike, that that I, that I look at your campaign, and obviously I've got to try and offer the alternative and the counter to what you're going to, you know, in effect, feel is the battle ahead. Um, and one of them is, if you are in a situation where uh, your campaign gathers strength, let's just say, uh, the next couple of years suddenly there's a slight door opens. Um, to the movement, what you get is you get organisations who work out ways to make sure that that door doesn't get moved open any further. So, for example, American football, you run the risk. Do you want to play? Sign the waiver. Here's the danger of playing American football. You'll get this wage, but in, when you're 50, you might have Alzheimer's or dementia. Um, I am well aware of the fact that you're three to five times more likely to develop it, but they would say, sign this. And I think football and many other sports would do the same. Well, you, you, as ever, Peter, you're right on the money, and I mean the money. People like uh, uh, Cristiano Ronaldo, heading the ball is a very big part of his game. Messi, not so much. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, pff, the, the big money players who've got these colossal contracts, they... God forbid they get a diagnosis. They will be able to get the very best of health care. They will be able to provide for the families if they, if they pass away. They're going to be able to have uh, you know, uh, houses specially adapted for them if they are not able to walk or climb stairs. They're, they will have the money to live by 
you know, beyond our wildest dreams for the rest of their lives. What about players who play in the Scottish third or fourth or the Highland League or the juniors who play there all their lives and have exactly the same uh, risks, training regime, game risks of, of dementia? They will not make a penny from the game. And look at the players that are in the, in the Scottish study we're talking about. Uh, you know, who were, you know, won European Cups and who he won doubles and trebles and were Scottish internationals and big, big, big names. It didn't have a fraction of the fa financial, um, uh, you know, wealth from the game, which they should have yes. compared to the, the, the big name players of today. With that in mind, and I know Amanda Capel and her family uh, worked hard in very difficult circumstances and, and in times, I think, very tiring and tragic circumstances to see their dad, who was so radiant at the forefront, at the higher echelons of Scottish sport, suddenly diminished to this uh, shell of a person who can no longer relate to uh, any of their family or any of those uh, wonderful memories. Um, is, there a, is there almost a situation where if you can't get the removal of the heading of the ball in every level of football, is there almost a caveat which says, well, can we have a safety net in place which says, is there a personal care that can be available to every footballer, uh, you know, at these levels to try and help with the care? Because I, I, I'm not being a cynic. You know it's a difficult battle ahead, but is there another area within your fight that you'd say, if I can't get that, can I get this and this in place? You mean from a financial viewpoint? Well, just basically from a care so point of view. Support. Right, yeah. well, my mother never headed a football in her life. Yes. My mother went to one football match in her life. England 5, Scotland 1 at Wembley in 1973, and I was there. My mum wasn't a football fan. My mum died in my arms. I cared for her for the last six years of her life. I took early retirement from STV so I could do that, and I'm, I'm very glad that I had the chance and the means and the time to do that. So it was mum and I on our own. And I watched a vibrant, intelligent, beautiful woman just degenerate um, over a period of, of years. And then towards the end, very, very gradually, and then suddenly very steeply. Um, that was the same dementia that Frank Capel had. Yes. That was the same dementia that Bobby Charlton had, that Billy McNeil had. Dementia is dementia. Yes. Okay, there are very, you know, there are different causal aspects, alcohol, genetics, uh, trauma to the brain, um, and my mother's dementia was was quite mild in that she didn't wander, she didn't leave the house, she didn't think night was day and, and slept all day and walked around all night. She wasn't aggressive, she wasn't violent, she wasn't destructive around her, she was just a little old lady. But I watched these you know, symptoms suddenly grow. I had to toilet her, I had to wash her, I had to change her, I had to uh, feed her by hand, I had to do all of those things. And I'm starting to well up a bit now, but. I, I loved being able to do that because it was a, it was a privilege. Um, but it's the same, dementia is, okay, yeah, there are different stages and different types, but it is still losing that person twice. And I, and I was lucky my mum could walk. Had she not been able to walk, that was a different world. I mean, that's nursing home, care home territory because I could not physically lift her. I had to several times when she'd had a tumble, but, you know, dementia is a desperate, desperate, desperate thing. And for people to say, oh, but it's part of football and it's always been part of football and it should always be part of football. Well, I'll tell you what, let's have a chat and I'll tell you what I had to do. And yeah. what, I'm not alone. There's millions of people out there who've had to do that. Yeah. And with that point that you highlighted with, with regards to the fact that people who don't play sport can uh, contract dementia, um, that in itself is an obstacle because apart from highlighting the percentages and the probability which you are doing uh, in an excellent way, whether it be three to five times more likely for people within sport, surely that's the, that's the, the, the biggest thing that you're, the biggest obstacle and the biggest uh, reason that sports are kicking back against you by saying, well, wait a minute, it's a percentage, yeah. but it's not the definitive proof. Yeah. Well, I would, I would disagree. I would argue that the Scottish study has shown that there is, there is, there is a link. The other thing is, and it's very interesting, here we are in, in industrial Scotland. We used to put men down coal mines without helmets, without gloves, without boots. You know, far less uh, a health and safety uh, you know, 
bill and legislation to say you can't do that. Yes. You know, we used to get into a car without putting a seatbelt on. We used to smoke in public. There are lots of things we have done that we now no longer do because it's dangerous. Now, to my mind, it's absolutely as, as, as clear as day that repeated traumas to the head are going to be very, very dangerous to you. Yeah, I mean, you're talking from a point of view, you, you're, you're preaching to the converted because, uh, again, I look at it and I think it is such a, a, an admirable quality that you have and a battle ahead, which I think lots of people will admire. I'm My gonna, point. I'm not going to win this fight. People like Amanda Coppell are going to win this fight. People like John Stiles are going to win this fight. Billy McNeil's family, uh, you know, uh, Gordon McQueen's family. Uh, he, and, and it's not just Scot. Obviously, the Scottish game is 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 in Scotland. The English game is 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 much bigger. The European game is much greater. So it's the it's the families who are going to say, "Look, hang on, um, I've just watched my grandfather die from dementia from heading the ball. There's no way I'm going to let my children yeah. play football and head the ball because I know what it does." Do you anticipate a long fight? I anticipate a very long fight. I don't think FIFA for a moment are going to go, "Mike, you're bang on the money. We're going to ban it now." Yeah. next week. I know they won't. Because what would happen, and this may well be the case that, that, that they're being so reticent, is that if they do that, then they're going to open the door to lawsuits. And people are going to go, oh, hang on, what about my great-great-great-grandfather? Yeah. He, you know? So I understand uh, why it's not just going to be picked up like that. Um, but it will be a long fight, and it's not just my fight. I think it, uh, it's parents. It's a, it's a parental thing. Yeah. You know, when my wee lad was going to play football at school, I said, knock yourself out, enjoy the game, but whatever you do, don't head the ball. And, and I think lots of parents will be, uh, and I know are, in that, uh, in that cohort. And also looking back on their children who are now maybe late teenagers or early 20s and think, well, you know, he played football for five, ten years. She played football for six years yeah. heading the ball. I wonder what... And the thing is, that damage... You know, you're not going to get that next, the, the, the repercussions, you're not going to get that next week. That could be 30, 40 years away. I, I think Amanda Capel, Gail Perry, who's uh, Craig Brown's um, Ali. family member. Ali McLeod. Uh, Ali McLeod, sorry. Um, and you get to a situation where you want to see them succeed. I think it's a long, hard battle, Mike. I, I really do hope that they can succeed, even if it is in a situation where, you know, it's kids first, then it's maybe youth level, then it's just a gradual acceptance, as you say, from a seatbelt to changing people's attitude to smoking. All of these things are a gradual process. Well, I disagree, Peter, because look at how football has changed in the last X years, right? Active and passive offsides. Yes. Right. How long can a goalkeeper hold the ball before he or she distributes it? Right, I'm, I couldn't tell you how many substitutes you're allowed. Yeah, but they don't have financial implications, well, well, uh, Mike. Well, hang on, but one does. The biggest, the, the daddy of them all is VAR. Yeah. So don't tell me football can't change. It can. Yeah, it can. But the problem I have with, uh, you know, trying to win this battle is the fact that so many people want to avoid having to put anything in place which is a financial burden to them. Um, in this world, which we know now, football is a big business and they don't want to set up, for example, which I think would be a great situation, which Chris Sutton highlighted in this whole campaign, which is a care plan in place for people who have to look after, you know, a Frank Coppell, a Billy McNeil. When you see this colossus in sport, suddenly, as you said, diminished. I, I think but, the but reluctant... Prevention is better than cure here. Uh, uh, absolutely, but uh, the, the problem is, as I sit here with you, I think it's a great battle. I think it's a long battle, but I think the biggest problem is is you face a situation where so many big clubs yeah. and the business itself will try and avoid any responsibility financially, either going back the way or going forward to say, we're going to put something in, in place that can help people who are aware of the dangers, who sign the contract, um, and also fundamentally, I wonder if they're actually going to get to the point, and I hope FIFA will at least open their door to hear your argument, which is compelling and I think common sense. Um, I hope they're able to open the door and say, OK, we'll sit down and maybe in the future we can change it. Ultimately for you and Amanda and the people that you've spoken to, what do you see in the in the, the short term and long term from this? Well, you and I used to sit in the same office. I'm a storyteller, I'm a journalist. I take people's stories, I turn them around and I tell them. 
and uh, I'm going to continue to do that and message the people who need to hear this and many who don't. That, that today is a great example with Amanda, very bravely uh, opening the doors into her private life and her grief. And the, co the quote she came out with today, which was, you know, I nearly dropped my pencil, was like, today would have been Frank's 75th birthday instead, and we should have been, you know, celebrating today and planning our futures together. Instead, I've been grieving him for 10 years and I'm still in mourning. Now, that, you know, FIFA needs to hear that. And I don't for a minute believe they have not followed me on, on X Twitter, that they're not following my social media feeds. I'm, I'm sure that they will be aware of. And it's not just me. There are, um, you know, other campaigns. Um, you, you talk about Jeff Assel's family. Yeah. Um, Bill Gates used to play for uh, Middlesbrough in England. His family are way ahead of me on this. Uh, th there are campaigns all over the UK, and I'm sure there are in Europe too, uh, to get um, the, the, the word out. I'm not going to go to a, a football match and have a big sign-up. I'm, I'm, you know, I've got a much greater weapon in my armoury, and that's social media. Yeah. And I was a journalist, it was my job to tell stories, and I'm going to keep telling Amanda Capel's story, Gail Perry's story, the McQueen family story, the McNeil family story, that this is dangerous. It's a slow start, certain killer, and it has to stop. Yeah, and if there is a message that you would like to deliver, because you know the, the way social media works, if there was a message that you could deliver down the barrel of the gun of that camera right now to someone who um, you haven't yet spoken to to try and get the message across, what would that be? Football will be better and safer without heading the ball. Look at the great teams, the, the Dutch total football team of the 70s. Look at any, any Barcelona team, any Real Madrid team, any Liverpool team uh, that, that, that has won multiple European trophies. The, the Brazil teams that have won the World Cup. Look how many times headed goals or headed balls are seen in those performances. Very little. The best football is played on the floor and without heading, football is better and more importantly, safer. And as a final thought on this, um, I think the other aspect of this that we t have to talk about, Mike, just to finish off, is, is the human element of it, which is the responsibility after they've entertained, after they've given so many people wonderful memories. A lot of people do not understand Amanda Capel's um, plight after it when you have to look after your parent. That's the difficult part. And... and oh, Ma to where Amanda needs to be congratulated again is that she she fought and won to get Frank's Law, which is a, uh, what you're talking about, which is the social care element. The fact that, uh, uh, you know, in Scotland, you would get free personal care if you were over a certain age. Well, Frank, sadly, was, you know, needing that personal care much, much earlier because he had a diagnosis of dementia from heading the ball. Uh, the financial aspect and, and also the compensation aspect is something I'm not getting into. There are other people who are, uh, and that's good for them. I, I think... My, uh, my message is much more fundamental. Prevention's better than cure. We need to make football better and safer by removing heading from the game. Mike Edwards, it's one of those days when I think it's a joy to speak to you. Good Thanks to very you, much. Thank you very much.